the athletes taking a stand after President Trump's attack on those who don't stand for the national anthem. The entire Cowboys team, including owner Jerry Jones, taking a knee. The American national anthem finds itself as a flashpoint in a bitter divide in the current American political climate. This is nothing new. It has always been a polarizing piece of music. It can represent both the best and the worst of American intentions. It can be a bitter indictment of Imperial America at war, like with Jimi Hendrix's cathartic and honestly still shocking performance at Woodstock in 1969 at the height of the Vietnam War. But it also can be an unapologetic and sincere celebration of American civic pride, like Whitney Houston's incredibly powerful performance at the Super Bowl at the start of the Gulf War. Both versions are from African American musicians that represent polar opposites in political intent, the celebration and condemnation of America at war. There are a lot of social and political layers at play here, but my question is, is there anything in the music itself that would lend to such performances? Maybe, that is a possibility, but let's be honest, the Star Spangled Banner in less capable hands represents kind of the worst of the United States of America. It's so often coarse, awkward, and unwieldy, an empty display of unrefined, braggadocious, and tone-deaf individualism, and sometimes just tone deafness. And the rocket, red it so often is the epitome of mediocrity, not just in technical performance, mind you, but also in taste and artistic expression. From the egregious fufara of Christina Aguilera's R&B melismas, to Steven Tyler's inexplicable shrieking, the Star Spangled Banner only very rarely rises to the level of artistry. How can that be when there are some versions of it which are so affecting? Well, in order to answer that question, we're gonna need to look at the history of the tune itself. The Anthem is an adaptation of an earlier work written by John Stafford Smith called The Anacreontic Song. It was commissioned by the Anacreontic Society, an 18th century London social club of amateur musicians as a virtuosic number for a baritone soloist. It was performed frequently at meetings and quickly became a fairly popular event, popular enough anyway so that the London Times would actually issue reviews of individual performances. Sometimes these performances were critiqued for, quote, over-dramatizing the words. Francis Scott Key's poem, The Defense of Fort McHenry, was set to the tune of the Anacreontic Song in 1814, and so was born the popular patriotic song, The Star-Spangled Banner. It was adopted as the official American national anthem in 1931. Now, there's a pretty big problem with using this melody as a national anthem, ostensibly a communal song sung in a ritual of civic and national pride. The melody was originally designed as a virtuosic showpiece for an individual singer, not the untrained masses. Part of what makes the Star Spangled Banner so difficult to sing is this extremely awkward prosody or poetic rhythm. In the English phrase, the bombs bursting in air, there's emphasis on bombs, burst, and air. But in the Star Spangled Banner, it's more like the bombs bursting in air. It's very strange. You put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. It's also very difficult because of all the relentless shifting between registers and melodic jumps. At one point, there's a melodic shift of a tenth. Now, these rather clunky aspects aside, the Star Spangled Banner's biggest fault as a national anthem lies in its exceptionally large ambitus. The range between its nadir, the lowest part in its melody, and its apex, the highest part in its melody. This ambitus is by far the largest I could find out of any national anthem. La Marseillaise has an ambitus of a ninth. O Canada has an ambitus of an octave. God Save the Queen has a very humble ambitus of a sixth. The Star Spangled Banner, on the other hand, has an ambitus of a twelfth, which is a range more typically suited for operatic arias versus neighborly sing-alongs. Traditionally, it's performed in the key of B flat, because I guess the consensus is that's the best compromise for everybody's vocal range. But it's still quite challenging because it lies outside the tessitura, or comfortable vocal range, for most vocal types. The low B flat, the Star Spangled Banner's nadir, is quite difficult for tenors and sopranos to project. But the apex of a high F is sometimes difficult for basses and altos to sing comfortably. What's especially strange in all of this? 
is that there are multiple nadirs and multiple apices. The nadir occurs on four separate occasions, and the apex, supposedly the high climax of the melody, occurs twice on the phrase rocket's red glare and land of the free. It's very rare to have multiple instances of the same melodic apex, and so we have this instinctual desire to have a unique high climax to a melody. And so, as a result of this desire, many performers alter the second apex to get an even higher note two octaves above the nadir. It's a more pleasing melody, but now we're in the territory where only trained singers are going to be able to sing it, not the masses. This de facto apex now changes the ambitus to a staggering two octaves. It occurs on an exceptionally sharp vowel, the E of the word free, which is difficult to shape pleasantly. The significance of this occurring on the lyric Land of the Free is not lost on many. In Tony Kushner's play Angels in America, it's framed like this. The white cracker who wrote the national anthem knew what he was doing. He set the word free to a note so high nobody could reach it. That was deliberate. Nothing on earth sounds less like freedom to me. You can think of it as a fairly brutal metaphor for the American experience. The anthem invites everybody to try and sing along with this heroic melody, but punishes everybody who tries and cannot. It sounds simple and attainable, like the American dream, but is in fact a gauntlet only navigated by a few. Pop, I am a dime a dozen and so are you. I am not a dime a dozen! I am Willie Loman and you are Fifth Loman! I am not a leader of men, Willie, and neither are you! For these reasons, many musicians have sought ways of making the melody more egalitarian. Maybe not by changing the melody outright, but instead finding some other ways of framing the melody so it represents a more attainable idea of America. Pete Seeger, the great American folk singer and <clears throat> sometimes political agitator, attempted this by encouraging people to sing along, but starting in a key that's almost comically low so that it ends up in a reasonable register by the end. In the 2004 Athens Olympics, Peter Briner's instrumental arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner paired the first apex with a much gentler orchestration and reharmonization to create a contrast with the more expected military bombast. This was met by some confusion and irritation. One listener wrote, As a musician, teacher, and citizen of the US, I am deeply offended. Another wrote, Why do performers and arrangers find it necessary to change the melody, harmony, and bass lines? Why? Because we can. Because we are the bringers of destruction in your nation's long twilight. We are coming for you, America. We are coming for you. Speaking of dissonance, Russian composer Igor Stravinsky caused a similar consternation with his version of the Star Spangled Banner about a half century earlier during the start of World War II. While he was living in Los Angeles, he wrote of his desire to do my bit in these grievous times towards fostering and preserving the spirit of patriotism in this country. He was an astute outside observer of what the melody truly was and noted, the standardized version is difficult for all but the experts and everyone should be able to sing it with facility. It was an earnest attempt by a great genius of modern music to spread national unity and pride. Of course, however, this arrangement was written by a Russian immigrant, so you can't help but wonder if a tinge of xenophobia influenced public opinion. Early performances of his arrangement were met with ambivalence or hostility. One reviewer wrote that the striking chord changes may be disturbing to the layman's ear. This is Stravinsky we're talking about, right? The composer of the Rite of Spring, so that's to be expected. But today, when we listen back to his arrangement, we're shocked for a different reason, how utterly normal it sounds to us. The striking chord changes may be disturbing. In an infamous incident, Stravinsky was threatened by the Boston Police Department before a 1944 performance. The cops cited an obscure Massachusetts law, which is still on the books, by the way, that charged a hundred dollar fine for embellishing the Star Spangled Banner. Let him change it just once and we'll grab him, one of the police captains told the Boston newspaper. Why that hostility? Why was there that reaction at what we just heard? 
These three examples from Pete Seeger, Peter Breiner, and Stravinsky were all attempts at democratizing the Star Spangled Banner in one way or another. There seems to have been this feeling that these musical arrangements were somehow seditious or even treasonous, as if any change by the musical elite for the benefit of the masses was a part of some sort of communist anti-American coup. <laughs> Crush capitalism. Stravinsky later in his life became quite a devout Russian Orthodox Christian. He wrote that he wanted to give his arrangement the character of a church hymn, as if not only to express the feelings of religion and grandiosity, but also the sense of community and shared experience through singing, rather than simply watching somebody perform the national anthem. Because the American national anthem is typically experienced as an audience watching a performance. Instead of, we're gonna sing the national anthem, it's we're gonna watch you sing the national anthem. I imagine that those people who react negatively to any reinterpretation of the Star Spangled Banner, even if it's for the benefit of civic pride, find the ritual of listening to a mediocre performance of a daunting melody in a way comforting. Not in the sense of the spectacle of seeing somebody fail its musical challenges, but instead they might find comfort in the mediocrity of the performance. They feel like, well, maybe it's okay to not worry about the musical shortcomings or that there are no musical shortcomings. They might feel that somebody trying to temper its thorny technical challenges like Mr. Stravinsky tried to is somehow using weird musical voodoo to corrupt something pure. Because like the United States, the Star Spangled Banner is flawed, filled with grand aspirations, but unsubtle and vulgar in the wrong hands. Those countless musicians and singers who aren't able to account for its flaws will achieve a sort of crass mediocrity. But those who can transform the anthem's flaws will rise above them and may have in their hands the ability to achieve artistic greatness. I know of no better metaphor of describing the fractured American experience. The Star Spangled Banner is not a great piece of music, but it is the perfect anthem for the United States of America. The white cracker who wrote the national anthem knew what he was doing. He set the word free to a note so high nobody could reach it. <laughs> Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this video essay. If you enjoy what I do here on this channel, please comment, like, and subscribe. I have a new video coming out every Monday. If you really enjoy what I do here, please consider joining my Patreon. It's my patrons over at my Patreon that let me do this sort of thing week after week. And until next time, everybody. Peace.